Welcome to episode 230. Today, I'm interviewing author L.L. McKinney about her new debut novel, A Blade So Black. Get excited to hear all about this young adult urban contemporary retelling of Alice's adventures in Wonderland with a twist of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Tamara Ford, and welcome to Book Chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. So glad you clicked play today. Here on Book Chat, we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, book recommendation lists, interviews, and more. Be sure to check out shelfaddiction.com for even more content. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about today's interview guest. L.L. McKinney is a writer, a poet, and an active member in the Kitlet community. She's an advocate for equality and inclusion in publishing and the creator of the hashtag What WOC Writers Hear. She spent time in the slush by serving as a reader for agents and participating as a judge in various online writing contests. If you'd like to comment on something you've heard during today's episode, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Shelf Addiction or call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe. The links for everything related to today's episode are below in the show notes. Welcome, Elle. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm, it's Tuesday and Monday is in the past and we're moving forward. Yes, let's do this because we have a lot to cover. So are you ready to get started? I am always ready to get started. Awesome. So actually, I'd like to start off with um, learning a little bit about your hashtag because I was looking at your Twitter account and your bio and I was really drawn to your hashtag uh, what WOC writes Mm -hmm. here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, what that was is I was on Twitter and um, I think there's something on one of the Al Jazeera Twitter accounts as well, because there was like a little Skype interview for it as well. Um, But there was a hashtag that got started by another author and it was what women writers hear. And it was about uh, one author was like uh, someone had walked up to her and said, I didn't know you were a woman. I'm glad I didn't. I wouldn't have picked up your books if I did Um, stuff like that. And so I was like, yeah, we, Like, this is a hashtag that I absolutely, like, you know, feel with and feel for. But on the same token, there's stuff that women of color who are writers that we hear that other writers don't hear. For instance, like, I have my Black girl book for the year. Or I don't really understand this. Um, Can you make them more Black or more Chinese or more, you know, whatever, which usually means leaning into a stereotype that that person might be more familiar with. Um, So those are things that women of color who are authors hear on top of the things that, you know, just women writers hear in general. And I've always been particularly passionate about, you know, acknowledging that, yes, this is in a state of oppression that I'm part of, but I also need to acknowledge my own privilege, even within being oppressed, because if we don't do that from all the way down, it's not going to, uh, nobody's going to wind up okay. Right. The things that you hear, are they from readers or publishers or? These are things that I've heard from, um, uh, from editors. These are stories that other women who are authors of color have shared from editors as well. Um, from agents and there are editors and agents out there who are really pushing for diversity and pushing for representation uh, for people within the publishing industry, as well as, you know, our readers, our audience, because it matters on both sides of the spectrum. You know, it matters for the people who are making the books and the people who are reading them all the way across. So there are, of course, editors and agents who are, you know, 100 percent behind that. But there's still those, you know, dark spots here and there where folks just haven't caught on um, or maybe aren't that eager to catch on, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It definitely sounds like it's something that's going to raise awareness, you know, of authors that write for, you know, people of color, <laughs> different races and things like that. It's really going to, I think, help 
everyone. I mean, a lot of people don't know. Honestly, a lot of people are ignorant to a lot of stuff. And so to kind of see some of this on Twitter, which is the place to be right now, I think it's going to, it's a positive thing, you know? I really enjoy, well, I have like this love hate relationship with Twitter um, because Twitter is, is, is a great place where you can have a conversation and people can listen without taking part. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like eavesdropping without, you know, eavesdropping um, yeah. because it happens and people can read it in real time or go back and see the exchanges, you know? Um, so it's a way for you to just sort of be, you know, shooting the breeze with my sis over here. And people are aware of this thing that we're now talking about. Oh, this is an issue because now this author has joined in and now that author has joined in. But at the same time, mm-hmm. Twitter's not exactly the best place for nuance. Cause you know, I mean, you only got 280 <laughs> characters to make this yeah. statement and then you got to try and give a, a thesis and followed by a th- dissertation about this one tweet, you know, cause then people read mm-hmm. into what wasn't said. And it's like, well, I can't have, like, we can't have a, honest to goodness back and forth about this so you know i I really enjoy twitter but it has its hang-ups as most you know social media platforms do um twitter is also an excellent place for people who have no business talking about something or being in a conversation to just slide their way don't we know about that (laughs) don't we know all about that (laughs) so i love it and it's great that it's out there that means kids can see it they know that we're concerned about their well-being and them seeing themselves so it just a lot of eyes are able to be on the conversation and it, it doesn't people in publishing can't say, well, this is a one-off or that's the exception right. to the rule. No, we are all talking about this. We're all feeling this and you can't get away from it because it's out there for readers to see now. It's not like hush, hush secrecy, which publishing can do sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Well, that's awesome. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what books you're currently reading. Are you reading anything right now? I am doing um, a lot of audio books, actually, because uh, I hey, was traveling. I love audio. <laughs> um, but I recently, I read and then listened to, which is a weird thing. I, I don't know. I'm an odd creature. Um, audio books, I'll pick up like a physical book and try it. Maybe I get into it. Maybe I finish it. Maybe I don't. I can't do that with audiobooks. Even though I know Audible is like, eh, if you don't like it, you can turn it back in and we'll give you another one. I don't know. It's, I'm weird with that. Um, so I usually will get audiobooks of books that I already own. Um, mm-hmm. And then I'll try a couple new ones. Like one of them is um, I recently started listening to uh, Six of Crows. And that's because I was reading Six of Crows. And I said this on Twitter. Uh, there was a lady at my job, the day job. And as I'm reading it, she walks up and she goes, Oh, I love those books. I was so upset when such and such died. And I'm like, really? Um, so spoiler, right? Yeah. So I couldn't finish physically reading it. So I started listening to it, you know, it it just made it easier. Um, and I finished it in like two days. (laughs) It was really good. I loved it. I mean, most people know that. Um, I also have been reading, I read The Bells by Danielle Clayton. Amazing book. I cannot wait Mm -hmm. for the second one. I'm actually reading that right now myself. It's so good. (laughs) It's so good. It makes me hungry. So I don't appreciate Danielle. If you're listening, (laughs) ma'am, I don't appreciate that. Um, Yes. But it makes me hungry. (laughs) All the food references Uh, is crazy. I'm also, uh, I just finished before I started listening to, well, reading, then listening to Six of Crows, uh, Dread Nation by Justina Ireland, which is amazing. Um, And it's, because I I like The Walking Dead. I don't really like Mm. Dawn of the Dead or other things. I'm not huge on zombies, but The Walking Dead got me. And Justina Ireland's series got me. Um, what else am I reading? Oh, I just also got, um, I have um, Arc of Seafire by Natalie C. Parker. Getting ready to get into that. Super excited. And hmm, <laughs> there's so many books. I have, um, let's see. I'm excited for, I haven't read it yet, but I'm excited for, it comes out next week is Darius the Great is Not Okay uh, Okay. by Adib Karam. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm excited for that. 
Oh man, there are so many books. There are so many books. Yes, I could tell that you're like a reader and I love that because you just have a laundry list of books like most of us readers do. Well, I, like you have to read if you're going to write. Like that's, mm-hmm. you know, exercising those muscles in, in your mind. It's, you're picking up things that you put down later on. Like maybe you don't exactly use that particular turn of phrase, but you're like, I never thought of seeing this particular, you know, um, the way water moves, I've never thought of describing it using, I don't know, taste or something like that. So many things come up with like just reading like the bells. I have never, I see the world in food now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Walking around and everything is a meal. And that did not happen until the bell. So it, it helps exercise those muscles when I'm not really using them um, in my own writing, but it still keeps me engaged. And to write, you got to read. You just have to. Absolutely. So do you have a favorite author? And by that, I mean, you will auto buy anything they write. You don't even have to know what it's about. You just see their name and click buy. N.K. Jemison. Oh, yeah, she's good. Automatically. Every time. I fell in love um, with her prose, with her word building. I see. OK, I didn't know that I could appreciate reading stuff in second person <laughs> until I came across, um, which. I also didn't really like things in first person until certain books, but um, second person, I didn't even know that was a thing you could do. She out here breaking rules and winning awards and being a trifecta of all three books, just one of Hugo. I, this woman is everything in science fiction and fantasy that I aspire to be. She's an auto buy every time. Yes. I, I second that. <laughs> so do you have any authors uh, that you think maybe have inspired your writing style a little bit? Um, hmm. I don't know. I think there are some authors who I've read who, and I won't name names, um, have inspired it because I'm like, I'm going, I'm not going to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. but I can't really think of anybody that I could say, I aspire to write like this person. Like I'll do things like I aspire to describe things like Danielle Clayton. I aspire yes. to elicit emotions, you know, such as fear and um, desire, not necessarily, you know, hey, that person over there is cute or whatever, but desire to have something done, to have a, a, a particular outcome come about, um, you know, an anger and righteous anger at that um, through Justina Ireland. I love her books. Uh, Jane was... I. I felt Jane on so many levels in Dread Nation. Um, I aspire to write relationships platonically and with family like Angie Thomas. You know, that's kind Mm. of what I do. There's not one writer where it's like, I want to write like them, but bits and pieces that I see in these incredible women and their craft. It's like, I want to do that and layer that into mine, you know, somehow. So I I see, you know, like I want to write in a way where the words just sort of flow almost lyrically, literally in her latest book with like Heidi Helig um, for Muse of Fire is getting her to come out. Literal music in that, like sheet music. It's beautiful. I've heard some of it. Um, So it's just puzzle pieces of these great artists. I I would love to lay that down on my own tapestry in my own way. Wonderful. So let's talk about A Blade So Black. Tell me, do you think you've achieved some of these things with this first book of yours? I mean, I certainly hope so. Um, (laughs) I I hope so too. I think, I I know one thing that I do well is I can write a mean fight scene. Like I I can kick somebody's ass on the page. I can do that. Um, Yeah. But... You know, I mean, you're always your own worst critic. You're always like, it could be better. It could be stronger. And I've had, you know, these amazing women, you know, some of them have read it and have told me like, mm-hmm. hey, I really like how you did this. And I love how you do that. And I'm just over here like, oh, stop, um, <laughs> you know, yes. just sort of toe in the ground. But I mean, I'm hope that I have people seem to have like taken a liking to it. It's gotten some good buzz, some good reviews. Um, Angie Thomas said that it's the fantasy, the black girl fantasy she's been waiting for. Um, so I'm, I, and that's I feel high like praise, I'm, right? I feel like I'm, yeah. I'm doing good. Um, 
I'm pushing that, you know, the next one will be better. And then the next one will be better. That's always the goal is that the next book is better than the last one. But the last one is the best one that I could have written at that time. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that somebody will be able to see something that maybe will inspire them a little bit. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of it. So this is a fun mashup. It's like a YA genre. It has fantasy and it's a retelling. How did you come to the idea of using, you know, the backgrounds of Alice in Wonderland in Atlanta? Okay. Um, so I have told this story a couple of times and I'll have people who like, for the last, where did you get the story idea? And folks are like, came to me in a dream or, you know, this is the book of my heart. I've been working on this for years. And I who was sitting on my mama's couch <laughs> um, about maybe five, six years ago, watching reruns of Supernatural. <laughs> and during one of those reruns, they made a reference to Buffy because they were fighting vampires at the point. It was just like this obscure Buffy reference. As I laughed. And it was right around the same time that they had sort of announced that, hey, we're about to go into production for a live action Alice in Wonderland. And I was like, oh, that's going to be interesting. Huh. And so, you know, having just read that and watching this and Buffy, I was like, well, they're going to redo Alice in Wonderland, but it's going to be like the same old timey Alice in Wonderland. Wouldn't it be cool if, you know, she was modern? What would she do? What would Wonderland look like? I mean, how would she get to Wonderland? Would she even know it was Wonderland? Would she think it was a dream? So I wrote the first scene, which was a fight scene, um, which was, you know, why is she in Wonderland? Because I'm sitting, you know, you fall into Wonderland. Little Alice in the original story wanders around. Me, yeah. I'm like, I ain't going nowhere. Like, what is this? What is going on? I'm either going to wait till I wake up or somebody comes to get me. I'm not about to wander through whatever this is. That's not what I'm about to do. So, <laughs> yeah, unless I had weapons and knew how to use them. So I wrote a fight scene and I liked it and I just sort of kept going. Wow. So, OK, when she's in Wonderland, is she dreaming? Because when I was reading the synopsis, you know, um, by the way, guys, the book comes out next week, so it's not out yet unless you've been lucky enough to get an early copy. Um, but is this is she in a dream? Or, so is she fighting like in her dreams or does she really know how to fight? And she's so really using me. It's like a combination, but she's in the dream world. OK, so it's like when human beings go to sleep and they dream. I mean, there's a place that you kind of go where stuff happens and you see it happen and you experience sometimes when you wake up you're there you know you remember it a lot of the times you don't really um so i've sort of based it on this idea that if enough people believe in something it kind of gives it life kind of like fairies you know how what was it a uh, hook peter pan i believe in fairies mm -hmm. and tigger bell is now okay and not dying or whatever um yeah so i kind of went with that where Enough people are dreaming. It has to go somewhere or it has to have an effect on the world somehow. Like this is a very powerful force, even if it's just like a subconscious force. So that's where the idea of Wonderland being an actual physical place came into being. So she's not okay. asleep and she's not dreaming. She literally crosses over into like this world between worlds. So it's like a parallel world where everything and everybody is composed of dreams from all around the world from the beginning of time. So you're going to have mm -hmm. structures in Wonderland that might look from like they're from like ancient times. And then you'll have structures that look like they're from the twenties. And maybe mm -hmm. you'll have structures that look like they're from the eighties, but over in England or Ireland, you know, so it's the entire world goes into making this place. And that's why it's so, I figure, you know, my interpretation of why Wonderland is so, like, weird and shifting and never the same. And, you know, you have things like unbirthdays and people walking around as playing cards and, you know, mm -hmm. white rabbits running around talking about how they about to be late, you know, wearing yeah. waistcoats and right. watches. So I just, you know, everything that you've ever dreamed of where your mind has just sort of put it out there along with these billions of other people who have existed, trillions of other people who have existed over the years. 
it's what has composed Wonderland. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about Alice because I love a strong heroine. And being that Alice is being compared to Buffy, I want to know a little bit about (laughs) her. So tell me about Alice. Alice is, she is very strong, but she also doubts herself a lot. I mean, she's a teenage girl. um, She's a black teenage girl. And I mean, we're just going to be real. Society doesn't tell you the best about yourself at any age in being a black woman, but particularly when you're young, you know. Um, So she has, um, you know, doubts in herself, doubts in her abilities, but she's still out there, you know, kicking butt and taking names. So she's able to physically fight a girl's bad. You know, she's able to utilize different weapons. She, you know, she knows what she's supposed to be doing and she knows how to do it, but she still has a little bit of doubt in herself. And through this story, we sort of see her go from you know, maybe I'm not cut out for this to, okay, we doing this. This is how we're doing it. This is why we're doing it. Like get with the program again out of the way. So I'm okay. happy to see her grow during this story. And so she's not only strong physically, but she's strong mentally and willfully as well. It takes some getting for her to, uh, some doing for her to get there, but that's my girl. So does this follow like the trope where, you know, obviously she's a teenager and she's doing all this without her parents being aware of what's going on? Okay. So yes and no, because a while ago, uh, Justina Ireland, she started this uh, hashtag called YA with soul. And essentially what that is, is if these stories like Twilight or Harry Potter or the Hunger Games had happened to black children, and those black parents have been around. <laughs> it had been a whole oh, no, story. yeah. So oh, Alice's sure. mother, she's very much present. She doesn't know what's going on, but she does know that her child is coming home late. Um, you know, not answering her phone because technology doesn't work in Wonderland. I mean, there are no cell phone towers, so yeah. Um, even though man has conceived of cell phone towers, they just don't spring up in wonderland it kind of has to be constructed and wonderland folk got ways to communicate they ain't about to be bothered with ios whatever update they they don't got right so uh alice's mom is kind of an obstacle for alice because you know alice has chores alice is breaking rules alice has to deal with consequences and her mom is laying them out and alice is like i wish i could tell you but if i do you're going to think I'm crazy. And if you, well, let me not say crazy. You're going to think that I'm uh, sort of possibly, you know, might be having some episodes. And mm-hmm. if you do believe me, you're not going to let me do this. So, right. and I need to do this. Like she has reasons why she needs to go to Wonderland and beat the crap out of stuff. Yeah. You know, it's how she gets through with life, with what she's going through in her personal life. This helps. So her mom is very much present and it's very much an obstacle to her getting stuff done, which is how I feel it would be, you know, in real life situations. Like, yeah, you have to go save the world, but those dishes ain't done. And which one do you think is going to cause you more problems right now? So, (laughs) yeah. And I actually really love that because so few of young adult fantasy have parental figures around and it kind of as an adult reading YA it grounds it for me when I know wait there is a parent somewhere and something is wrong even though you know it and it doesn't pull you out of the fantastical stuff that the characters are dealing with but it's just nice to know that people care about them in their real worlds right yeah and I mean like all of these kids who are out there you know you don't have to have these particular things happen in your life in order for you to be this hero. You don't have to have be the chosen one because some wizard off your parents somewhere. Like you can have a normal life, be an everyday person and still have this crop up. Like, you know, she's not running around because of some prophecy. She just happened to be in this place at this time and she ran into old boy and she decided, yeah, I think I might want to do this. So, okay. So let's talk about old boy. Okay. So <laughs> is she, <laughs> we have to talk about the love interest. All teens, you know, any teen girl, you know, come on, you do little crazy things for the little boys. Yeah. So is she, is this like love at first sight or is it kind of like a love triangle going on? What's, okay. what's going on with that? 
what happens is she meets him and no, it's not love at first sight. Cause the first thing, and there's um, an excerpt on um, entertainment weekly. So this is, this is known. Um, it's out there if you want to go check it out, um, you know, before it comes out, but she runs into him. And the first thing she sees him do is kill one of these monsters with this sword that she has on his hat that he has on his back. And, uh, in her mind, she's like, this is, this is happening. I, what? So she's busy trying to reconcile that. Yeah, he's cute and everything, but there's a dead monster over there and you have a sword. What is going on? So then we skip forward a little bit and they've established, you know, this sort of um, relationship where he's showing her, you know, this is Wonderland. This is what we do. This is now what you do. I'm going to help you do it. I'm your partner. I'm here for you. I got you back. And so as they sort of, you know, do this together, she kind of catches a few feelings, but she's telling herself that it's not, you know, it's not a thing. Um and of course, one of the reasons is mom, because what we're not going to do is bring him around with his sword and killing monsters with mom. Also, no. Yeah. So that's another <laughs> re- way that mom is a deterrent. You know, she has, has to, you know, try to bring home a boy who is one thing entirely, but a boy who's not even really human. Who That's just a whole other mess that, yeah, we're not going to do that right now. Maybe oh, later. That sounds Maybe so later. fun. <laughs> that, that sounds fun. Well, I mean, I that's that. her. What actually yeah. happens? Different story. You can grab them pages. Okay. You'll find out. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about kind of the end. I love a realistic ending. I have to admit. So are we left on a cliffhanger or do we kind of get like a little bit of closure? here? Mm, I mean, it's the first book of, you know, uh, there are others that are coming and there's closure to some of the things but the story continues um Mm -hmm. and you it is i'd say yeah i guess it's a cliffhanger it didn't start out that way but then i hit that point and i'm like you know what i'm stopping there because here comes you know the next book um but when you know you, you do find out more you get deeper into the world it's i mean I've never felt one way or the other about cliffhangers. I know some people hate them with like a passion. Um, And then some people like they love them. And that's just with books in general. Some people about love or hate or whatever. So, (laughs) yeah. You know, honestly, I'm not opposed to a cliffhanger, but it does hurt a little bit when you have to wait a full year or more for the next. (laughs) Oh, I understand. (laughs) And I understand. Yeah. I still have like scars from when I got to the end of the fourth Harry Potter book <laughs> and we didn't get another one for how long. So I understand. I get it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's to a degree where that part of this, like that's how the story came about. And even after editing and after it underwent however many different drafts, you know, it didn't start out that way, mm-hmm. but that's the way it's been for the longest. And that's what makes mm-hmm. sense for the story overall. Okay. How long is this series? How long are you envisioning this? A trilogy? More? What are we in for? Oh, well, what we're in for and what I envision may be two different things because publishing is its own beast, right? Oh, so yeah. um, <laughs> the uh, it was purchased as a two book deal. So we are definitely getting books one and two. Um, I had envisioned about four. How that plans out, whether we'll get, you know, bits and pieces of it here in novellas, maybe. Or I I don't know. Uh, I'm going to just put it out in the universe. Lord, if you hear me answer my prayer, I want all four. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, (laughs) And not only because I started out that way, but these covers are amazing. And I want all four suits of cars just just to put up on my wall. I want all four covers. I want spade, heart, diamond, and club. I want them all. So um, Yeah, I was looking at the cover. I like it. It's really, it's really sharp. Those are those, I want to be able to do what I had originally envisioned, and I want a cool cover set. So th- those, those are my wishes. Um, what happens, I know we get the first two for certain. So are you going to be uh, doing an audiobook version as well? There is an audiobook. Um, I actually, right. um, just a little bit ago, finished up with listening to various um, voices who could be Alice, 
and, you know, giving my feedback. And one was chosen. And uh, I think she's going to be amazing. Uh, everybody who I got clips for was amazing. Um, so it's, it's really, I appreciate my publisher giving me that opportunity to, and they sort of did the same thing with um, when it came to the cover. You know, they were like, here are options that we have. And I was like, that one. And that's mm-hmm. my Alice. She's on my cover. And they did the same thing with audio. Like, here are the voices. And I was like, that one. And so, you know, after back and forth a little bit, it seems like they're going to go with, you know, my first choice as well. Um, so I'm really thrilled. And she's going to oh, be amazing. Okay. And I can't wait to hear her. Oh, I can't wait either. I love a good audio book. So I might have to check it out on audio when it comes out. There's probably no ETA at this time, huh? I'm... What I think the plan is, is that audio will, is planned to drop the same day. Okay. So at least that's what I'm hearing. It could change because, again, publishing is whatever. It, just, it works in mysterious ways and oftentimes frustrating ways. So that is what I understand is the plan is that it all drops September 25th. Excellent. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share about A Blade So Black before we do the lightning round? Um, I'm really excited for this type of story for black girls and for black boys to read as well, because I don't believe in that, you know, this is a girl book, this is a boy book type situation. Um, this is a book for people who like these types of books. That's what that is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm really excited for black children to read a story like this. Um, I went on a Twitter um, thread a little bit ago where, you know, being black, uh, black American and, you know, not necessarily knowing who my ancestors worshiped, who our heroes were, who our legends were, you know, having grown up with these Western tales of Alice in Wonderland and Cinderella, like Cinderella was our jam when we were younger, you know, that was the story Mm -hmm. that we knew. And now taking those stories that we grew up loving, like there was nothing wrong. That was the society you were part of. Assimilation is real. And putting a spin on it, it creates a whole new folklore, I think. That's just as valid, you know. So it's because it mirrors an experience. And that experience is one that is being lived by millions of people today. So I'm I'm excited to see. And it's Alice and it's Dread Nation and it's the Bells. It's, you know, these stories that are taking these Western um, worlds and uh, these Western flares and just infusing them with blackness and creating, you know, adding to our culture because we have culture. I don't care what nobody says. So I'm I'm just eager to add to that. And I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to do this. I didn't have these books when I was a kid. I'm gonna make damn sure my nieces and nephews have them. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I must say, before we do this round, I wish you the best of luck on your release week. I know it's going to be amazing. I'm so ready for it. Uh, We got all sorts of things happening. I'm having the Turn Up Tea Party release. That's also a hashtag on Twitter. If you can't make the release party, which is in Kansas City, don't worry. There will be online shenanigans, contests and prizes as well. So check out that hashtag Turn Up Tea Party. Awesome. Okay. So are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. Hit me with Okay. So let me just tell you what it is real fast. So it's just 60 seconds, a bunch of questions. You just answer as many as you can, as quick as you can. Some are open-ended. Some are like, would you rather style? And the only rule is you must answer. You can't choose neither. You can't say both and you can't skip. (laughs) Okay. All right. (laughs) All right. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. Physical books or eBooks? Physical. Hero or villain? Mm-hmm. Well, considering that villains are the heroes of their own story, I'm gonna say heroes because it. All right. What's your favorite book or series from when you're you were a child? I read Harry Potter. Um, really enjoyed that. But thinking about that, I'm gonna have to say like my favorite series is. Oh uh, God, I'm blanking on it. There by it's this little boy, Artemis Fowl. There we go. This Artemis Fowl series. All right. There we go. <laughs> Android or Apple? I have an iPhone, so it's, it's Apple. Marvel or DC? 
Oh my god, why? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, just because my favorite superhero is Spider-Man, followed very closely by Storm, and now Black Panther, I'm going to have to give it to Marvel. All right, pops or pop or soda? Pop. All right, time's up. (laughs) (laughs) See, look, a minute goes so fast, right? It does, it does. Yes. Well, thanks for doing that. It was really fun. Of course, I had fun. Except for that Marvel DC question. (laughs) That one hurt. That always gets everyone. Sometimes it's such a hard choice, but you know, choices. (laughs) It has to be made. One of them got to go. There we go. Yes. Okay, well, we're going to end things there. Be sure to follow L.L. McKinney on her social media and pick up a copy of her book, A Blade So Black, available for pre-order now, available next week, September 25th. And all the links for everything, including how to reach her on social media, are in the show notes. So it has been a pleasure, Elle. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. Oh, yay. All right, that's it, everyone. Thanks for spending the time with us here on the shelf addiction podcast and as always happy reading take care everyone if you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support there are a few things you can do head on over to apple podcast and leave a positive five-star review you can follow me on twitter at shelf addiction most importantly you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish including author interviews thank you for listening and until next time happy reading